This presentation deals with a quick review of the cortical spinal tract. The cortical spinal tract is a neuronal pathway that originates in the brain, specifically the motor cortex, travels down the brain stem, crosses over the midline, and eventually ends up in the anterior horn of the spinal cord gray. The cortical spinal tract originates in cells in uh, Broadman's area 4 of the motor cortex. This is the central sulcus. We call this the precentral gyrus. Behind the central sulcus, we call this the postcentral gyrus, area 312. 312 receives sensory input. Area 4 sends out motor information. Thus, it's the origin of the cortical spinal tract. Once again, here's the cortical spinal tract coming down and terminating in the anterior horn cells. Here's a closer look at the termination. These are anterior horn cells, or alpha motor neurons. They reside in the ventral horn of the spinal cord gray. Here's the gray matter of the spinal cord. Here's the central canal. This is a high cervical cross-section. So the ventral horn is over in this region right here. And these are the cells that receive input from the corticospinal tract. Here's just another depiction of the terminations of the corticospinal tract. The corticospinal tract terminates mainly in the ventral horn. There are some axons that project to the dorsal horn and the intermediate gray. And it should be noted that about 10% of the cortical spinal tract axons do not cross the midline but form a small tract called the anterior cortical spinal tract. So the lateral cortical spinal tract would sit here in the lateral funiculus of the spinal cord. The anterior cortical spinal tract would sit here in the anterior funiculus. Let's look at some more details. All right, here's some cross-sections. Uh, this is an actual photo of a section through the cerebral cortex, basal ganglia, thalamus, internal capsule. And here are some drawings. This is the midbrain, the pons, the medulla, and the spinal cord. All right, we're looking at the cortical spinal tract. It's named because it goes from cortex to spinal cord, cortex to spinal cord. It originates in area four. These cells are called bait cells or pyramidal cells. So this would be area four, precentral gyrus. And the cells are called pyramidal cells, thus we also call it the pyramidal tract. There's some connection there. Axons come out of the bait cells or the pyramidal cells and travel down through the internal capsule, which is a white fiber bundle which exists between the thalamus and some of the basal ganglia. So that's the internal capsule. From there, they continue down in the region of the midbrain, the upside down Mickey Mouse section here, and they take up resonance in the cerebral peduncle or cruz cerebri. Remember there are cerebellar peduncles, there are also cerebral peduncles. They're feet. So these are feet of the cerebrum. They're just millions and millions of axons, myelinated axons, grouped together. And in the center is where the cortical spinal tract sits. Right above or internal to the cruz cerebri is the substantia nigra. That's Latin for black substance. Here you're going to find do dopamine containing cells that also contain neuromelanin. So they're black on a gross specimen. You can actually see some black cells here. Um, if these cells get destroyed, you're going to end up with a Parkinson, Parkinson's disease. All right, the cortical spinal tract is sitting here in the cruz cerebri and makes its way down to the pons. 
So what do we have labeled here? We have the fourth ventricle where the pons is open at the top. Here's the pons with its bulge. We have the medulla here, the closed medulla, and the spinal cord. So cortical spinal fibers are going to come down through the internal capsule, through the center of the cerebral peduncle. They're going to get lost here in the pontine gray. They're going to continue down into the medulla. They're going to collect on the ventral surface of the medulla in two bumps we call pyramids. I guess they kind of look like uh, Cheops and Giza in cross-section. Two little triangular bumps. Those are called pyramids, pyramidal tract, pyramidal cells. They're called pyramids. And there's a decussation at the lower part of the medulla, right where it meets the spinal cord. 90% of these cortical spinal tract fibers cross the midline in what's called the motor decussation. And then they pile up in the lateral funiculus of the spinal cord and become the cortical spinal tract proper, or the anterior, I mean the lateral cortical spinal tract. Those fibers that do not cross are called the anterior cortical spinal tract. It's about 10% of the fibers. Here, at different levels, all the way from cervical levels to sacral levels, they're going to synapse mainly on the large alpha motor neurons of the ventral horn anterior horn cells, another name. What does the cortical spinal tract do? It controls piano playing and other fine digital movements. Detailed movements of the hand, the forearm, the feet, the toes. And once again they synapse mainly in the ventral horn. A few clinical notes here. We call, call this the upper motor neuron pathway, or the upper motor neuron. Why? Because it's up. It's higher up than the anterior horn cell. It's the upper motor neuron. It's traveling from brain to spinal cord. From spinal cord to muscle, we call the lower motor neuron, and we'll talk more about that in a second. But if you were to damage the cortical spinal tract, either with a stroke, killing off the cells of origin, or cuts in the pons, medulla, some kind of tumor or lesion in the spinal cord, you're going to get spasticity and hemiplegia. That is, the patient's muscles are not going to waste away, but they're going to become weak, but they're also going to become rigid and spastic, and the person is going to be hyperreflexive. So they're going to kind of be uh, twitchy and, and all contracted, but no muscle wasting. These are hallmarks of an upper motor neuron lesion. Once again, here's the cells of origin, the ventral horn cells, or the alpha motor neurons. That's where the cortical spinal tract is going to synapse. So these are the cells of origin of the final common pathway or the low, these are the lower motor neuron. Uh, also in this area you're going to find the spinal accessory nucleus, which innervates the trapezius and sternocleidomastoid, and the phrenic nucleus, C345 keeps the diaphragm alive, are going to be in the air. They have cortical input too. And by the way, we call it the cortical spinal tract from cortex to alpha motor neuron. We call it the cortical bulbar tract, or tracts, from cortex to cranial nerve motor nuclei. Bulbar is an old term for brainstem. So we have cortical bulbars and cortical spinals influencing movement. Just a note on motor units. This is a term you're going to come across. There are large motor neurons. Uh, motor units and small motor units. Alpha motor neuron plus the skeletal muscle fibers it innervates. That's what a motor a unit is. A small motor unit results in precise movements. A large motor unit results in coarser movements or axial movements. So an example, a large motor unit would be say, oh like a muscle of the thigh, the quads, or uh, the gluteus maximus. 
Um, you don't need uh, small motor units there because you don't need a one-to-one -one relationship between axon or neuron and muscle fiber because these are coarse, kind of an all-or-none thing. But if you're doing fine, uh, precise movements like typing or playing a piano, etc., you want a one, almost a one-to-one -one relationship between the lower motor neuron coming in and the muscle fiber being activated say flexor digitorum longus something like that a word on somatotopy or, or the distribution of alpha motor neurons alpha motor neurons that control distal musculature are located laterally this is the ventral horn central canal would be here so out here laterally, you're going to have alpha motor neurons that control the hand and the forearm, the arm, the shoulder, and most medial, these neurons are going to control the trunk. So cortical spinal tract axons come down and synapse on these different cells. And these different cells have different functions. The more medial is the more proximal musculature. And just a note again, here's cross sections at various levels of the spinal cord. We have a lot of white matter and a lot of ventral horn at the cervical level and at the lumbar level. Why? Because we have an arm, we have a leg. So we have the brachial plexus and we have the lumbosacral plexus. A little pathology correlation. This patient has no anterior horn cells. This is due to polio. So polio wipes out the lower motor neurons. How are the muscles going to look? What's going to happen to the biceps? Flaccid paralysis, hypotonic. And this is supposed to show that the uh, ventral roots have degenerated here due to polio at this level. Here we're back to the pyramidal cells in area four of the motor cortex. So these are the upper motor neurons. We were just looking at lower motor neurons. Now we're back to the upper motor neurons. They have a large apical dendrite and a very small axon. It's hard to see here. If we move to this Golgi stain, we can see the apical dendrite and this tiny, tiny little axon. But remember that axon is over three foot long. It's got to go from the cerebral cortex down to the sacral spinal cord. Here's a horseradish peroxidase stain. And these pyramidal cells are lit up. You can see the apical dendrites and this tiny little axon. And kind of pyramidal shaped here. A little triangle. Some more in pathology. ALS is a devastating disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. It wipes out the upper motor neurons and lower motor neurons, so you get a double whammy. Here the cortical spinal tract is wiped out. See how the, this is a myelin stain, so myelin is going to stain dark. So you can see here these myelinated fibers are dying or are dead. And the anterior horn cells are dead too. This is a stroke. Uh, say you get a stroke of the middle cerebral artery. You can wipe out area four of the precentral gyrus. And you're going to get upper motor neuron signs on the opposite side of the body because these axons cross in the pyramids. All right, a note on the Babinski sign. The Babinski sign is a way to tell if a person has an upper motor neuron lesion. Rubbing the side of the foot or sole with a blunt object can result in three responses. So you can take a car key or a pencil or something and rub here. You get a flexor response. The toes curve inward and the foot everts. This is a normal healthy or negative Babinski. The toes want to protect the bottom of the foot so they curve down. You can have an indifferent response. That's no response at all. Or you can have an extensor response or a positive Babinski where the big toe dorsiflexes or moves up, the rest of the toes fan out. That's a positive Babinski. It indicates damage to the central nervous system, upper motor neuron lesion, 
specifically this could be a cortical spinal tract lesion. This person may have spasticity and hyper, hyper reflexes. A lower motor neuron injury, anterior horn cell or total nerve lesion leads to flaccid paralysis. What's an example of a lower, lower motor neuron? A lower motor let's say nerve. The radial nerve would, con would be made up, the motor components of the radial nerve, say innervating the triceps, would be considered lower motor neurons or lower motor axons, a f part of the final common pathway. So it's cortical spinal tract, the anterior horn cell. Anterior horn cell sends out axons which make up nerves such as the radial nerve which then innervate muscles such as the tricep. Those are lower motor neurons. Different clinical signs. This is Lou Gehrig who, does, who died of ALS. This is Stephen Hawking who's still alive. What uh, eventually takes these patients is paralysis of the diaphragm. Here's some other drawings depicting uh, other degenerative uh, situations of the spinal cord. If you have a stroke of the anterior spinal artery, this can wipe out the cortical spinal tract and the ventral horn, so you'll get upper and motor neuron signs. Subacute combined degeneration. Here you're losing the cortical spinal tract, so you'll have upper motor neuron signs, but you're also losing the dorsal column pathway, so you're going to lose two-point discrimination, vibration, and proprioception. Here is ALS, you're going to lose the cortical spinal tract and the ventral horn, causing massive paralysis. And here's tabes dorsalis, where you lose only the dorsal funiculi, or the dorsal column pathway, this is due to syphilis. So once again, you're going to have problems with proprioception, vibration, and two-point discrimination. Alright, a quick look at histological sections, and we'll be done here. Let's just follow a cortical spinal tract down from the midbrain. Remember, the cortical spinal tract originated in area four of the cerebral cortex. Axons came down through the internal capsule, which is just a white bundle fiber, a white bundle of fibers coming down, and they make their way into the cru cerebri, the feet of the cerebrum. So we know we're in midbrain here because we have the superior colliculus, which deals with vision. We have a central canal, or aqueduct of Sylvius. We have the cranial nerve 3 here, and the beginnings of the red nucleus. Cortical spinal tract is going to sit here in the center of the cruz cerebri. There are other fibers descending that are running here. Fibers from the parietal cortex, the temporal cortex, the occipital cortex and the frontal cortex, all running down, most of them going to the pons. But the cortical spinal tract runs in the center, the middle portion of the cruz cerebra. Here's the substantia nigra. Still in the midbrain, coming down, and here you can see how we've got these fibers labeled. From the parietal cortex, the temporal cortex, and the occipital cortex, down to the pons. Here's from the frontal cortex down to the pons. This is the cortical spinal tract. We've got the end of the midbrain here, decussation of the superior cerebellar pinochle. We've got the cortical spinal tract still sitting in the cruz cerebri, or the cerebral pinochles. Now we're getting into pons. This is considered pontine gray. A lot of little neurons here and fibers that are crossing the midline, but here's the cortical spinal tract, still seeking out the spinal cord, going south. The beginnings of the middle cerebellar peduncle, big middle cerebellar peduncle, we're at the level of the trigeminal nerve complex, cortical spinal tract, you can see it over here. Big middle cerebellar peduncle, this is a, a, a different view, we've got the cortex here, cerebellar cortex, Pons, middle cerebellar peduncle, still near the trigeminal nerve complex. Now we're at the level of the facial cranial nerve, cranial nerve 7. You can see the genu. Cortical spinal tract still plowing through 
the pons. Now we're getting at the level of the medulla. How do we know that? We have olive, we have inferior cerebellar peduncle, and we have pyramid. So that cortical spinal tract that was in the center of the pons is now moving ventrally in the medulla and piling up is a nice little Gizar Cheops shaped pyramid right here. Here you can see the pyramid again. Principal olive, inferior cerebellar peduncle, we're about at the level of the vestibular complex. Here is the medulla opened up. Olives, nice pyramid here, medial lumniscus. We've got two fused baby feet here, so the medulla is closing up, fourth ventricle is closing up. Still have a nice discrete pyramid. We're at the level of the hypoglossal nerve. Here we go, we're entering spinal cord. So we have our two feet here. They look like baby feet, don't they? The pyramid it says, hey, I want to go to the opposite side. So it's going to cross the midline. And here we are in cervical spinal cord, the cortical spinal tract from the right side is now over on the left side. Piling up. So this is the lateral cortical spinal tract. Down here would be a little bit of the uncrossed anterior cortical spinal tract. From here these fibers are going to come in and synapse on the ventral horn cells. So you need to remember there's differences whether you have a stroke is going to affect uh, motor movement on the opposite side of the body if you have a stroke of the cortex but if you have a cut of the cortical spinal tract in the spinal cord you're going to affect things on the same side as the lesion. That's the end. Thank you very much. Check out this video for a nice uh, overall explanation. Thank you.